Are we living in the last generation? And are the leaders of the world being moved, unbeknownst to them, by a spirit from beneath that will plunge the world into the final scenes of Earth's history? Many are quick to cry a foul and accuse those that are studying the Bible of being time-setters. They point to such scriptures as Matthew 24, verse 36, But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But does this scripture stand alone, placing the servants of God on the same plane as unbelievers, both oblivious to the timing of his return? Many neglect to reconcile even Christ's words in Matthew 24, verse 33 and 34. So likewise ye, when ye shall see all these things, know that it is near, even at the door. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Here, in no uncertain terms, Christ points to a definite time in describing this generation, the generation that sees all the aforementioned signs. The question is, are we in that time? You be the judge. Twenty twenty is the beginning of the age of catastrophe. It's kind of the future warning us about what's on the cards for us. Because the grim truth that I think we're not facing is that our civilization is now beginning to collapse in very real and very serious ways. The world is a different place today. We cannot uh, ignore the global security issue that could impact millions around the world. Without immediate action to support developing countries, inequalities and poverty will deepen, not to mention the geopolitical divide. We're on the cusp of not only a climate catastrophe, but also an economic catastrophe. The inflation rate soaring to its highest level in 30 years. Costs are going up everywhere. Food, electricity, water, medicine. It's a very pressing situation. But we're dealing with 7.8 billion people on Earth that need and rely on this supply chain system. We are challenged by the number of people in need. And these people are suffering in such a devastating way. They can't, you know, how are they supposed to get through the day? No, no, don't be sorry. We all know that we're past the point of no return. We lost 60% over to recycles, 9%. It's really a hard situation. Collapse. And as a and technological disruption. Inequality in a planetary emergency. So what happens when somebody now doesn't have a job, doesn't have the basic kind of access to resources that we take for granted in the rich world? You turn on the tap, water doesn't come out. You go to the store and there's not enough food. You press the button and there's no electricity. What happens? Well, history tells us when people grow suddenly poor, what happens is massive waves of authoritarianism and fascism. History tells us that in absolutely unsparing terms. So that's the story of Weimar Germany becoming Nazi Germany. It's the story of Stalinist Russia. It's the story of the Islamic world. It's also the story of America today. On January 29th, 1991, former President Herbert Walker Bush unveiled the motive behind the formation of the United Nations and its agenda. We have before us the opportunity to forge for ourselves and for future generations a new world order, a world where the rule of law, not the law of the jungle, governs the conduct of nations. When we are successful, and we will be, we have a real chance at this new world order, an order in which a credible United Nations can use its peacekeeping role to fulfill the promise and vision of the UN's founders. This is a very important story. 
the important story. In the midst of COVID-19, it's an historic opportunity to look at the facts of the world as it is, and then to focus on the solutions to some of our greatest problems. In the 75 years since the United Nations was founded, the human race has never had to face a set of challenges like we do right now. But together, we can overcome them. September 2020. The world is still in the grip of a global pandemic. There have been more than 27 million confirmed cases and more than 900,000 people have died. Billions of people have been in lockdown for months. Lives and livelihoods have been threatened and lost. But as some lockdowns are easing, people are emerging into a different, uncertain world with a new appetite for change. Today, we feel the weight of history on our shoulders. The COVID-19 pandemic has shown how fragile the world is. A microscopic virus has put us on our knees. And that fragility should make us humble. COVID-19 has been likened to an X-ray, exposing fractures in the skeleton of the societies we have built. A world with great inequality, which must be righted. And a world which must win the battle against climate catastrophe. The whole planet is at stake. So this is a moment to recognize that the way we have been moving leads nowhere and that we need to change course. Let's also be clear. The future is not just happening. The future is built by us, by a powerful community as you here in this room. We have the means to improve the states of the world. Leaders from around the world are advocating for a restructuring of global systems, more commonly referred to as the Great Reset. Unfortunately for many, this is a foreign concept, which, if they truly understood its implications, would cause alarm. Under the guise of the Great Reset, the United Nations, the World Economic Forum, the International Monetary Fund, and the World Health Organization are seeking to establish a system in which you will, in their own words, own nothing and be happy, all under the pretext of combating climate change. Through the use of a central bank digital currency, 15-minute cities, digital health certificates, and a digital ID, the world is being coerced into a digital prison as a purported solution to society's challenges. This is the plan that I have repeatedly warned about to take the tools of oppression used to tackle the coronavirus and use them all lockdowns, forced business closures, exclusion zones, isolation. We heard, we heard Angela Marsden earlier, businesses shut down, isolation at home, all of that. All of those measures, including destroying private property rights and private income in order to tackle the climate crisis. For too long, humanity has existed within dysfunctional and polluted cities that ignore nature. Now, a revolution in civilization is taking place. Imagine a traditional city and consolidating its footprint, designing to protect and enhance nature the line will be home to 9 million residents and will be built with a footprint of just 34 square kilometers. And we are designing it to provide a healthier, more sustainable quality of life. The line's communities are organized in three dimensions. Residents have access to all their daily needs within five minute walk neighborhoods. And the line's infrastructure makes it possible to travel end to end in 20 minutes with no need for cars resulting in zero carbon emissions. The Line, the city that delivers new wonders for the world. What can you do in 15 minutes? Empty the washing machine and hang up your fresh laundry? Read a couple of chapters of your favorite book? 
Watch half an episode of How I Met Your Mother? Well, creepy local authority bureaucrats would like to see your entire existence boiled down to the duration of a quarter of an hour with the arrival of so-called 15-minute cities. If the World Economic this Forum could lay out its perfect design for humanity, it would look like this. You would never leave your house. You would get rid of your car. You would ride your bike everywhere. You would walk to everything you needed within a 15-minute radius of your home, right? The, the pharmacy, the grocery store, grandma, everything, the school, everything would be within 15 minutes of your City. home. A quick and if you think ride. this is something out of a, a fantasy world, it's not. It's actually already been rolled out in a number of cities across the around the world, in Barcelona, in Melbourne, Australia, parts of Melbourne, um, Paris, and Milan. So this is already a reality, and they're continuing to push this out in more and more World Economic Forum controlled this countries. This and dystopian plan will see roads in some of Britain's most iconic towns and cities being blocked off, with cars being restricted to certain areas, all overseen by number plate recognition cameras installed everywhere, with a surveillance culture that would make Pyongyang well. envious. So basically, they're a top-down imposition, using the idea this would be a lovely livable street, active travel, it's all about people friendly oriented, but actually what it means is it's an attack on cars and our freedom of movement and independence. Welcome to Dystopia. Um, all our cities will probably end up now being broken up into precincts like uh, sci-fi films that were made predicting a dystopian future. You can't even travel into your next couple of roads now. Um, there's going to be fines if you leave your area or your 15 minute zone more than twice a week. Well, you don't even have to wait for the electric vehicle. I took a rental car from Budapest to drive into Ukraine a few months ago, and the car had been programmed in order to prevent me driving it into the war zone. Uh, the car had been programmed to die at the border. I couldn't figure out what had happened. It just And I, as I think I said on this show back then, if you think that's just going to be applied to Ukraine, no, no, no. Uh, and it's in fact, I think Joe Biden has just made it mandatory that all American cars have to have a kill switch in them by 2026. So there is actually now a, a governmental war on freedom of movement. See, right now, the WF are providing a platform for those pushing a My Carbon initiative. In my words, it's essentially a personal carbon social credit system that will track everything you do, everything you buy, everything you eat. It's like Big Brother. We're developing, through technology, an ability for consumers to measure their own carbon footprint. What does that mean? That's where are they traveling? How are they traveling? What are they eating? What are they consuming on the platform? So, individual carbon footprint tracker. Duconomy is a Swedish fintech that provides digital services to help consumers reduce the footprint generated by their consumption. With this in mind, Duconomy launched the 2030 calculator. It's the first credit card ever to stop you from overspending. Not based on your available funds, but rather on the levels of CO2 emissions caused by your consumption. Do Black helps you track your climate impact and ensures that you reduce it by 50% in line with the UN 2030 recommendation. The core purpose of Do Black is not only the ability to measure the impact of your consumption, but also bringing it to a direct halt making it a radical tool against climate change. Um, our concern is the combination of sort of a, a global singular ID that, that combines everything uh, with a digital currency, which is being pushed simultaneously along with uh, this kind of concept. So our concern is that you get to the point where it's very easy to literally flip a switch and prevent you from participating in society. Yes, it appears that the United Nations is very keen to introduce a global digital ID system that is linked to individuals' bank accounts. The plan is outlined in three new policy briefs from the UN titled A Global Digital Compact, Reforms to the International Finance Architecture and the Future of Outer Space Governance. In 2019, yeah. before COVID, the World Economic Forum and the UN put out a joint agreement that they were going to team up to fast forward the 2030 
agenda, also known as the Sustainable Development Goals, which is what a lot of this is about. This so in the really is a, it's a, it's a means of, of collecting data um, by your digital ID. Your digital ID is your face, really, your facial recognition will unlock everything that you need to access, goods and services, bank accounts, whatever. And, and that zero trust world uh, really, um, it, it means that you, in, in order to access all these goods and services and, and everything that you normally access in a free world, you won't be able to because you, you will have to authenticate all the time. To shop online, you'll have to use your digital ID to prove you are who you are, just to read your email, to use online banking, even to open your computer will require your digital ID. You'll be in digital jail until you open it with your digital key. All of this can be connected to your carbon footprint and the rest of your social credit score. Make no mistake, all of it is on the Chinese model that enables the state to watch, track and record everything you do and everywhere you go. The cameras are already in place around us and in our phones and screens alongside the microphones that can listen all of this can be tied to a central bank digital currency, not actual money you can hide under the mattress, just a digital credit rating monitored before any and every transaction. And what we're seeing in the world today, I think, is we are on the brink of a dramatic change where we are about to, and I'll say this boldly, we're about to abandon the traditional system of money and accounting and introduce a new one. And the new one, the new accounting, is what we call blockchain. It means digital. It means having a almost perfect record of every single transaction that happens in the economy. The ultimate objective is to move us to a cashless society. So you will no longer have that hard asset of that $20 bill or $10 bill. Your money will essentially be software. It will be a number in a program that the Fed, Treasury, the government, your political opponents will all have access to. Everything will be centralized. And again, this is not really about the money, although of course it is. This is about power and control because the government, such as it is, will have access to all of the information related to every single transaction you make. And finally, the third way we think CBDC can improve financial inclusion is through what we call programmability. That is, CBDC can allow government agencies and private sector players to program. By programming CBDC, those money can be precisely targeted for what kind of people can own and what kind of use this money can be utilized. The key difference in, with the CBDC is the central bank will have absolute control on the rules and regulations that will determine the use of that uh, expression of central bank liability. And also we will have the technology to enforce that. Those, are, those two issues are extremely important and that makes a huge difference with respect to what, she, to what cash is. But if you overstep perhaps your monthly carbon footprint, right. or if you say something that the government doesn't like, you engage in wrong think, they'll be able to turn off your access to your own money. So you will not be able to buy or sell anything. This, this is what I mean about how dangerous you're it is. You're shut out of the economy you are, if you're You a are thinker. shut out of the economy. And of course, it's all subjective. And it will right. be, all be in the hands of these Marxists, right? And so you and I won't be able to buy anything. This is why it's so dangerous, because this spells the end of your economic freedom. The and benefits of digital money, there are huge potential gains. It's not just about uh, digital forms of physical currency. You can have programmability you know, um, units of central bank currency with expiry dates. You could have, as I argue in my book, a potentially better, and yeah, some people might see it, or a darker world where the government decides that units of central bank money can be used to purchase some things, but not other things that it deems less desirable. Like so there are wonderful notions of things that can be done with digital money, but again, I fear that technology could take us to a better place, but equally has the potential to take us to a pretty dark place. Um, I think 
it, it's very hard for people who've grown up and enjoyed Western liberty and, and human liberty to imagine literally that we're going into a system where literally our homes, our cars, our communities become digital concentration camps. And the reality, as the financial system gets more controlling and more invasive, it's a little bit like bringing up a corral around us. And CBDCs, central bank digital currencies, and vaccine passports or digital IDs are sort of the last uh, shutting of the gate. So what is the connecting link between Agenda 2030, the Great Reset, and the final generation? The Bible says in Daniel 12, verse 1, And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was, since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered, everyone that shall be found written in the book. Once the leaders of the world establish their digital dystopian society, they will have every tool at their disposal to crush out dissent and compel the conscience. It is at that time when the world, as Bible prophecy has forewarned us, will be plunged into the last scenes of Earth's final crisis, a crisis in which we will have to choose whether we will yield conscientious obedience to the edicts of man or the commandments of God. The tools to bind us to a system that is contrary to the will of God is being erected all around us. Can you see it? And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. Are you paying attention? And when ye shall see Jerusalem, meaning the people of God, compass with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh, are you watching? Therefore, be also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. Are you ready? Watch ye and pray, lest ye enter into temptation. Are you watching and praying? Time is almost finished. Do you reflect the lovely image of Jesus as you should? Behold, I come quickly.